Welcome back to the channel, everybody. And today it's my number 25 team in my 2024 NFL Deep Dive series. It's the New England Patriots. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of the future videos. And New England is the team that I would argue saw the biggest reset of all 32 teams in the NFL. They really did the most in the most significant positions, I would say. They completely changed up their their culture uh, at the top by Bill Belichick after all these years, 25 years or however long it was, gone. Though Gerard Mayo was a Patriot his entire playing career, uh, was a coach on the Patriots, I believe his entire coaching career in the pros, was really groomed for this role. It's going to be the first time that somebody different is in charge here and how much is he going to try to imitate Bill Belichick how much is he going to try to be himself that's the giant question mark I think for this team in general coming in because the big mistake that so many of the coaches in the Belichick tree have made over the years is trying to do their Bill Belichick impersonation so Gerard Mayo is going to show that he can be his own man really for the first time in this coaching tree's history uh, at least in terms of the significant uh, members of the coaching tree, there's been like underlying guys who have gone to other places and done other things and sort of well-rounded themselves a little bit. But I think he did a great job bringing in the coaching staff that he brought in uh, underneath him coordinator, specifically Alex Van Pelt from Cleveland. We'll get to that. They reset the quarterback position. They brought back Jacoby Brissett, who was originally drafted by New England, got some play games in there before being traded out to the Indianapolis Colts and the first of many teams that he would play for. He's returned here as basically the bridge quarterback for their franchise, future franchise they're hoping, Drake May. We'll get to my thoughts on Drake May. They sort of beefed up certain position groups. Uh, they they did a great job on the defense of bringing back a lot of the, a lot of the guys who made that defense so good. That was really the only bright spot of this team last year. They were really inept on offense. They couldn't get anything going at any point in time, but that defense was great. Gerard Mayo kept a lot of his guys in there. And it'll be interesting to see how Gerard Mayo, who was not the defensive coordinator last year, technically, I mean, Bill Belichick was, there was, and then he was sort of along with Steve Belichick, like a defensive assistant type of a role. It'll be interesting to see how he, now as a head coach, how he makes that leap from being more of like an assistant coach to the guy fully in charge of overseeing everything. I wonder how much of a learning curve we're going to see in that aspect and how much that they're going to suffer for it. I think that there are really good aspects of this team. I think they did a great job uh, with certain aspects of the offensive line. Believe it or not, there, there's going to be certain aspects of that offensive line that are good, certain aspects that are bad. I really like the, the mixing and matching that they're, they're going to be able to do. But the big thing here is, is, is the guy at the top. And that's what we're going to start with right here and now. This is my 25th ranked coaching staff in the league. Uh, like I harped on there in the intro. We're going to keep going with it. It starts with Gerard Mayo. First time head coach. Wasn't a true coordinator of any type coming in. He was somebody who, as a player, was viewed as hyper-intelligent, high football IQ. You know, that's why he was that trusted Mike linebacker his entire career that he was in New England. You know, first-round pick. They really loved him. Belichick loved him, and he really meshed well with that entire culture and was part of some of the better years that this team had as well. Um, you know, it's when were there really bad years for the New England Patriots over the last 25? You'd be hard-pressed right there at the end. Like, that's really it. Um, the real task for him was bringing in a staff that was one that he would create his own footprint, though, that was unique to that of what they used to have with Bill Belichick. And it starts with the offensive coordinator, and that's Alex Van Pelt, who's my ninth ranked offensive coordinator. Now, some people might find that to be a little bit high. He's coming over from the Cleveland Browns. He was there from 2020 to 2023, four years. And I'm sorry, but how good was that Cleveland team just last year 
even on the offensive side of the ball, especially considering the circumstances in which they were playing under. He did a tremendous job. Now, Kevin Stefanski is also an offensive coach. I get that. But Alex Van Pelt bringing over that game planning, that strategizing, that that ways of developing your system so that in the most dire of straits, when your two best players go down with injuries and are there on the field and you got to rely on a bunch of no-name running backs, no-name running backs, late round young running backs, and a 40-year-old up to that point viewed as completely washed out quarterback in Joe Flacco, and you make the run that you did, I mean, it, fit, it was just amazing. It was just an amazing feat to see, and Van Pelt's got to take some credit for that. You know, because while, while Stefanski might have been overseeing everything as head coaches do, Van Pelt was the one, like, on, on the ground floor, you know, working out all the details and everything, while Kevin Stefanski sort of just, you know, checked off the things that he liked and scratched off the things that he didn't. And I, I just I just like Van Pelt bringing that in, having sort of this clean slate. I don't think there's a lot of pressure either for this team to be good right away. I think the defense being so good is going to help Van Pelt come up with a more... Uh, with a strategy that can maybe perhaps shorten games that are going to really give this team a chance to win probably more than people are expecting. And that also now goes over to the defensive coordinator. And that defensive coordinator is DeMarcus Covington. A name I've recognized as well. Really, really like it. It's his first year as a coordinator. His eighth year overall with the Patriots. He served as a defensive line coach for a couple of years. I think he was like an outside linebackers coach as well. But they had, he was a big part of this Patriots coaching staff. You know, this is an in-house promotion. Just the same as Gerard Mayo. So Gerard Mayo really doing what a lot, you see a lot of new head coaches do is that they keep on a lot of the people that were sort of part of their staff. You see coordinators do this all the time. And he basically did the same thing here. So I think what that was more than anything else is trying to create some type of continuity because the defense was so good last year. I think the Patriots lost three games last year where the defense gave up less than 10 points a game. Like that is like, I believe that's the number. Don't quote me on it. I believe that that, that is, that is the number you can, you know, fact check me later, but if it's not the number, that was pretty close to what what is actually happening so you want to create some continuity there they did a great job keeping again keeping some of the defensive players they added a couple of uh, guys here and there I don't feel like they lost anyone truly significant if they did they were sort of getting guys back they re-signed all the right players they got a tremendous group out here and there's just there's just a lot of pressure I believe on this staff to prove that this was a good idea that's really the only thing that's going to be weighing on this coaching staff throughout the year is that you have to show that there's at least something here. It's like when you put in that rookie quarterback on a terrible team with no expectations, you don't want, you don't expect him to go out there and make you a, make you a playoff team, make you a juggernaut. You don't even necessarily expect him to go out there on every drive and have it be a good drive. You know, you expect them to make mistakes. You expect them to trip up, but what you want to see is in those mistakes them grow from those mistakes and you want to see the flashes of what could be once they figure everything out and they get it all together and that's the real pressure that's on this staff right now so you get the 27th ranked head coach Gerard Mayo again it's hard to rank rookie head coaches especially first time head coaches this is I think a generous rating considering he didn't really this is his first real significant coaching job at all right in in the pros you know I I do like Uh, Covington because of the continuity there but still this is again his first real significant coaching job as a coordinator so it's hard to rank him higher than a 26th ranking that's what makes Van Pelt really the thing that elevates the overall uh, ranking of the coaching staff because and also he's going to have sort of free reign over this offense as well so how he uses the players that he has 
uh, that's going to be something uh, to see as well because they got an, an interesting little mixture here of veterans and young players and a bunch of unique skill sets, guys who are, you know, on the offensive line, you have guys who are great run blockers but terrible pass blockers and how him and his staff are going to elevate those players is going to be something to see and how Gerard Mayo and Covington without Bill Belichick overseeing it can maintain the defensive success that they saw last year. So let's start with the player grades here. And this is probably going to be the only team that we cover this year where the guy who's coming in to be the starter is going to be worse, probably overall graded than the guy who's the backup. And the only reason that is, is because it's Drake May. He's a rookie quarterback and they don't want to throw him to the fire right away. Jacoby Brissett is the 30th ranked quarterback for me, 30th ranked starting quarterback. It's a 74 grade. He's like a safe veteran. I don't, he's going to be the guy that comes in there and I don't think he's going to make a lot of mistakes. Will he make a lot of big plays? No, but he's also not going to make a lot of mistakes. He's not going to be this, he's not going to come in and make crippling mistakes throughout the game the way that a rookie quarterback would. And I think that's something that is going to actually elevate the overall success of the team. It certainly lowers the ceiling for what their success could possibly be because I think Drake May's upside, even this year as a rookie, would, if you got that upside constantly, you would create a fringe playoff team based upon this roster. But with the downside of it, you could have an absolute disaster, harm his development, harm his confidence, and that's not something you want to do. You want to bring in Jacoby Brissett. You want Brissett to start these games. You want Drake May to watch him, watch him play, watch him make mistakes, watch him have success, and then... You know, have those moments with Van Pelt on the sidelines looking at the tablet. Have those moments in the film room where Drake May's job this year is to increase his ability in the mental aspect of the game and not worry so much about getting out there and executing yet. And this has worked. This was a strategy that for generations was the move that a lot of teams did. Was, people sort of got away from this. In the last like 15, 20 years, the last significant quarterback that really sat on the bench that was a high, high draft pick that sat on the bench for a veteran purposely, the only one I can really think of is Patrick Mahomes. Every other quarterback that was taken early in a draft in the top 10 in the draft has played right away. And I think this draft was really unique for that with Michael Penix in particular and now Drake May here. But I really like that They've lifted the floor of what the disaster could possibly be on the offense. And in turn, actually gives this team a chance to be competitive. Much more, I think, than people are expecting throughout the season. So we move on here to the running back room. And we'll start with their ability as actual first and second down. Turn around, hand the ball off. Running backs, they're tied for 20th. Ramondre Stevenson gets an 84 grade for me. He's really going to be the bell cow back. Here they brought in Antonio Gibson as a free agent. He gets a 75 grade. Um, I've never been a big fan of Antonio Gibson, to be honest. Um, I always thought that he was at best serviceable in this role that he's going to have. Kevin Harris uh, is very comparable, I think, in what he will bring on these pure running situations. Uh, when you look at the receiving back, I mean, Antonio Gibson, I wouldn't even have him better here than than Ramondre Stevenson. I think him and Kevin Harris are just slightly below him. It's tied for 22nd here. If it were up to me, Ramondre Stevenson is your like 85% of the snaps in the season. If he can stay healthy, he truly is your best option. Uh, when he had Damian Harris as a compliment, that's really when he was at his best. So It'll be interesting to see how they find that number two back to kind of keep him fresh. He is more of a, like a between the tackles type back. He's had some successes, uh, you know, catching screen passes and whatnot, but he's not going to be somebody that goes out there like an Austin Eckler or Christian McCaffrey running routes and all that. That'll probably be more reserved for someone like Antonio Gibson, you know, when they want to spread him out in those situations. But I also don't know that that's going to happen all that often. Uh, which is why I also believe that you're going to see Ramondre Stevenson for most of the time if his health allows it. 
which could allow him to completely outplay some of these rankings. Maybe on the receiving back aspect, if he's on the field a lot, I don't expect there to be a whole lot of opportunities presented to him. Uh, but here, especially if their strategy is to let the defense sort of dictate the game and then use the run game to shorten games up to keep games close to give them a chance there at the end especially when that's why you bring in Joe Jacoby Brissett like we just covered this could actually be a really effective running back to have the really effective style of back to have and even with these depth pieces you know I know I crap on Antonio Gibson but him and Kevin Harris are very serviceable 2A and 2B running backs here for this backfield that they will be able to keep games shortened with these guys back here. Now, I would pref- I would have preferred maybe they went out and got like a a higher upside, you know, big play running back. They just don't have that here. You know, yeah, Ramondre Stevenson will have a big run every now and then, but he's not really that home run threat, right? He really is this like beat up the defense type of a runner. And I was just kind of wishing that they would have used some sort of like day two pick on getting some type of home run threat that plays in the backfield. I thought that I think that would have been something that would have just taken this backfield up a notch. Uh, and might have, and might have made them look even that much better. You know, I think that they're relatively deep still, though, and I just don't think that any of them are going to bring much help in the passing game. Uh, not the worst group uh, for for the passing game, but just still, just nothing to write home about. I really like it though for the clear team strategy that they have, which is we're gonna we're gonna keep that clock ticking for as long as we can. And just wait for the play, basically rope-a-dope teams uh, from the looks of it uh, for most of the season. Now this is going to be the part where they really start to struggle. You know, the wide receiver room, the weapons in the passing game, there's not a whole lot going on here. You know, you have Douglas, who last year really came on. And I actually really like him as an option. I think he's the best guy that they got, to be honest. And I think that he has a real opportunity, especially in an offense that is going to to be you know he can be a great extension of the run game almost with screen with bubble screen passes you know those types of plays get the ball in his hands you know get yards get upfield may make somebody miss big play opportunities i think he can bring that to you and he's got that speed option he's really the one of the true home run threats that you're going to see on the field throughout the entire entirety of a game kendrick Bourne got a contract extension he gets a 74 for me he's like the number two guy Juju Smith-Schuster, I mean, I've been down on him for a while. And I put him here as a starter. But he's got some competition here that I think is going to really be working to take snaps away. Particularly the rookie Jalen Polk. uh, KJ Osborne, who was brought in. They drafted Javon Baker. And they have Tyquan Thornton, who's that straight line speed home run hitter. Kayshawn Boutte, who I don't know if he makes the team, to be honest. I think him and Jalen Rager will be doing some competing for that final roster spot in the wide receiver room. But I think they'll be keeping quite a bit of wide receivers here. Um, They couldn't end up keeping probably, I would say, seven wide receivers on this roster. uh, If you include the two rookies, KJ Osborne, Tyquan Thornton. But Jalen Polk, you know, the rope for me for Juju Smith-Schuster... Probably going to be real short. I think Jalen Polk could probably win the starting job in training camp, if not slightly before that, uh, as like officially, I would say. I know that there's some depth charts have him as already starting. Uh, Him and KJ Osborne both starting, uh, in fact. Uh, But I wouldn't... KJ Osborne, it's kind of... He's best served as a number three wide receiver, and I think that they can do a better wide receiver set maybe even though I grade him and Jalen Polk the same I think by the end of the season it's gonna you're gonna see Douglas Kendrick Bourne and Polk as your top three receivers getting the most snaps and then followed by KJ Osborne uh, or Juju Smith-Schuster who I do think is still gonna get opportunities but it's a very weak overall uh, wide receiver room with 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 some upside you know with some upside they're very young 
three guys are going to be uh, at their disposal, disposal with one year of NFL experience. So there is something to that. Uh, they just don't have, like, right now that true number one receiver. They just don't have that true number one receiver. They're going to hope that Jalen Polk uh, becomes that guy. And then as you go on to the tight ends, they actually have the 13th best tight end in the league. It's Austin Hooper. He gets an 83 grade for me. Uh, they brought in, uh, sorry, Hunter Henry, not Austin. Hunter Henry. Uh, Austin Hooper is the backup. He gets 66. Uh, Jaheim Bell gets a 65. He really fell off for a lot of people. I think he could be, you know, a sneaky tight end too for them throughout the year. I think he'll beat out Austin Hooper uh, by middle of the season. But this is going to be the guy, uh, again, between... DeMar, between Douglas and Hunter Henry and Ramondre Stevenson being like your top three guys really right now, it really does point to the sign of this is going to be like, we're going to, you know, we're going to chip away at teams. You know, we're not, you know, you're, they're not going to, teams are going to be able to play press coverage on the outside, I think relatively successfully. But how the, how they navigate, you know, they once they start pulling guys close to the line, I think that's when you'll start to see guys like Tyquan Thornton get out there who's got that straight line speed, and that's going to open up things for them because I do think a majority of this offense is going to be done between the hashes and under under 12 yards down the field. That's where this, that's where this team's going to live, and they have an opportunity to do it relatively successfully, I think. You know, it's... To be able to just chip away at teams, teams are going to be used to wind out to play back. They're going to spread them out. You're going to be able to spread them out too. You got the bodies to do it. You got the unique skill sets to be able to do it as well. You can have an opportunity where it's Jalen Polk and Kendrick Bourne on the outsides. You get Demario Douglas and KJ Osborne playing there in the slot with Hunter Henry as a tight end. There's there's your empty formation. There's some unique skill sets out there where you know again. No one's going to be really overly intimidating anyone on the defense. No defense coordinator is going to be losing sleep at night over any of these guys. But there's enough there where Alex Van Pelt's going to be able to draw up some plays that are going to get guys open. And you never know what happens after that. Once the ball gets into somebody's hands, you know, KJ Osborne, a, a Douglas, you know, once the ball gets in their hands, you know, bets are off. At that point. So there is some opportunity in here. Uh, weapons wise. It's just the lacking of that true top end guy. Is really at the end of the day. Going to be the thing that holds them back the most. And now let's talk about the thing that's going to hold them back. Absolutely the most. It's the pass blocking. Dead last in the NFL. Now. This is why that quick, short passing game is going to also be incredibly advantageous for them because it will be the workaround for this lack of talent, for the lack of a better term. You know, Michael Owenu, you know, playing right tackle. That's sort of, I guess, where he's going to be now settled in for his tenure here. He's still good. He'd be much, I'd grade him much higher if he was in at guard right now, but... It is what it is. They got Chuka. This was, I don't get it for the left tackle coming from Pittsburgh. Sir, to me, that's, he's like a serviceable backup that you wouldn't mind coming in. And if you had to play him for a game or two, you're not, I don't think you'd be, you know, too worried about it, but he's your starter. Don't love it. Cole Strange and City Sal. Pass blocking is just not what they do. David Andrews sort of just like a middle center in terms of pass blocking. Again, pass blocking is not really what this interior offensive line does at all. Uh, when you take a look at some of the backups they have here, they have Connor McDermott, who is really the only next serviceable guy. They drafted Caden Wallace, completely overdrafted Caden Wallace, I might add, uh, to play left tackle, I guess, eventually. You know, Andrew Stoiber's there. They drafted Lane Robinson, who had some potential, never really came on to who he needed to be. Uh, Antonio Maffi was drafted last year. Just, eh. Jake Andrews is your backup center. Calvin Anderson, Vidarian Lowe, you hope that they never play. You don't really have, like, Connor McDermott, I guess, is like your sixth offensive lineman here because he can play some guard if you need him to as well. 
but like there's just not a lot of depth here in terms of the pass blocking ability of this group it's so poor and it's really what's going to hold them back and also i would have to say this is another good reason why you don't play drake may this season is because of this offensive line you're still trying to fit all the pieces in here you're still probably a year away at least a year away's worth of player additions and moving guys around and all that investing in free agents uh, when you get to the run blocking however they're the seventh best run blocking offensive line by my estimation in the entire league david andrews is an absolute beast in this aspect of the game i really like cole strange and city sal how they played last year together this interior group run fantastic you know core four for a left tackle in the running game serviceable michael owenu again solid across the board would have graded him better if he was at guard that's sort of the story for him but they're the seventh best run blocking team so their offense we've been talking about it this entire time their offense is completely 100 percent built to just let the defense win you this game and don't screw it up. You know, again, not a lot of high upside in the modern NFL. They're not going to be a playoff team. But they are going to frustrate so many teams because of this type of aspect and this type of team building that they currently developed here. Even with some of these backups, they don't really have, again, the, the depth on the offensive line is just not good outside of Connor McDermott. Who, but again, Carl McDermott grades out great in the run game too for a backup. So he's a really, it's another good little swing guy that you have in there. If a guy picks up an injury, kick. if a guard picks up an injury, you kick Michael Owenu inside. Carl McDermott goes and plays the tackle. And you might actually have a better offensive line overall um, in at least one aspect. Maybe in the passing block, pass block aspect. But man, this is a good group for this aspect. This is the most bipolar football team in the entire league. It really, it really is, and they're really driven. They're going to be driven by this run game. If they, this offensive line performs well, and they're a four and a half to five yards per carry run game this year with Ramondre Stevenson back there, who can take the pounding, who can, who's a beat him up to style running back. You know, sleep on this team all you want. Again. They're not going to make the playoffs. This offense is probably going to be bottom 10 in the league statistically. But teams are going to be annoyed. And teams are going to be tired after playing this After playing this team. It's going to be a lot of shortened games. And they're going to be in a lot of games. They're going to, they're going to keep games closer than people think. And it's this right here. This great group of offensive linemen for run block. Just run blocking because then you get this. Pass blocking. Not saying it. The same group. No. Absolutely not. Drop back 25 times a game. Run the ball 50 times a game. And you'll have way more success. So what guys like Hunter Henry and Austin Hooper, Jaheim Bell bring, it's really just a C blocking grade. You know, sort of just right down the middle. You know, nothing special. Nothing right home about. Uh, again, the depth of the offensive line issues, giant problem. The pass blocking is going to be a giant issue throughout the whole year. The pass game in general is going to be the issue with this with this offense. The run game is going to be, I think, pretty pretty damn good. It's going to be right up there, uh, upper half of the league, I would say, at worst. And but it could we could possibly be dealing with the worst statistical output by a passing offense in the NFL that we've seen in a long time. Uh, just based, just again, for all the reasons we said, just a lack of high-end talent. And that reflects in them being ranked the last passing offense in the entire league with a 72.9. And they're smack dab in the middle, 16th ranked rushing offense with a 75 grade. Their offense overall tied for 28th, 73.74. So much is valued in the passing offense. That's how you're going to stay in games. I don't see them having a lot of success within the division just because of how their division is shaped in terms of how that those offenses are. And they're, they're going to have to be able to score a lot of points against those teams because those teams are built to score fast and score locked in. So that's going to be a real struggle. That's six losses likely right there. But there's going to be certain teams that they're going to be able to play this year where that 16th ranked rush offense mixed with this defense we're about to cover 
is is going is going to lead them to maybe some underrated success. So let's get here to the defense. We'll start with the pass rush here off the edge and the front four. Matthew Judon gets an 81 grade. Josh Uche gets a 71 grade. They're the 25th ranked edge group here. Keon White, I think, is a real dark horse. Uh, third option here, I think, especially with the way that they run their defense. You're going to see a lot of different combinations of guys. So I really think Keon White's going to get a really, really high snap count, as will Anthony Jennings, and we'll get to him um, a little bit later. Uh, but in terms of just, you know, the overall skill rate, they are 25th. When you get to the interior group, they have the 12th best interior rush group with Christian Barmore and Armin Watts, who they just brought in. Jeremiah Farms is going to be a very underrated low-key part of this uh, defensive line rotation as well. But you're going to see really a lot of these guys get on the field. You're going to I think you'll see Sam Roberts quite a bit as well, even though I don't grade him up that high. But there's about, I would say, eight guys on this that are considered defensive linemen that you're going to see lining up in a whole bunch of different places, a whole bunch of different styles with a whole bunch of different responsibilities. And that overall is going to make this a really effective group. And on pure skill level, especially with this edge room, it's probably not there. Judon's getting older. You know, some injuries are kicking up for him. If he can get back to the form that he was just more recently, then, the, yeah, this edge group does get elevated where he gets back to sort of that, like, middle to low end number one edge player. That's really where... That he was he was really at his best like when he first came over from Baltimore type of a deal, but still a group that is going that has a lot of different skill sets involved, a lot of different body types and guys who can, you know, you can see Christian Barmore, you know, you can maybe move him out a little bit. Armand Watts stays there in the middle or vice versa. You're gonna see Judon line up over a guard. You're gonna see. Maybe Uche will just be mostly an outside guy, but you'll see Keon White come in and line up. You know, he might line up over the center on, in certain uh, situations and just just trying to make the quarterbacks and the offensive coordinators do that little bit of extra thinking. You know, Dietrich Wise is somebody, again, he's going to see the field quite a bit. They love to use him uh, just because of the uniqueness of his body mixed with skill set. And how he does he does suit the system. You know, outside of the system, I wouldn't anticipate him being much of anything at all. But there are certain guys who fit this Belichick style defense that Gerard Mayo is definitely going to be utilizing here. That that just elevates them all. So it's it's gonna be a it's gonna be a good group here in the front four. You look at their linebackers in coverage, they have the 15th ranked linebacker group in pass coverage. You got Jelani Tavai, you got Sioni Taki Taki. Uh, you know, Jawan Bentley is more of like your early down linebacker. Uh, you're, I think you're going to see these two more often than not. Marte Mapu, I mean, he's somebody who's like that safety hybrid type. He's kind of like, but I mean, you have Jabril Peppers and Kyle Duggar who we'll get to who are basically the same. So he's basically the the backup to them more than anything else, but you'll mostly only ever see him at linebacker. I don't think you'll really ever see him play like a true safety role for this team. You know, John Trey Hunter comes in as a rookie. Raquan McMillan's there as a veteran presence. You know, it'd be interesting to see because Belichick liked to keep a, a lot of guys in this front seven rotation in particular for his defenses. So it'll be interesting to see as training camp goes on and they start to cut down to the 53 man roster, how much of these guys will actually be able to be kept but they have really good balance here in their linebacker room, uh, which is important to the style that they play. They got some, they got guys who have, uh, again, I keep going back to unique skill sets because that's what it is. They have certain roles and they have certain guys who in any other situation would be square pegs and round holes, but they, they purposely carve out whatever shape this player is and they find the hole and they put him right in. He's a perfect fit every time. It's, it's amazing what they do, even in the worst of times for the team's overall performances we've seen the last year in particular. But this is going to be, I believe the heart and soul of this team is going to be the Jelani Tavai, Sioni Takitaki, Jawan Bentley threesome. 
Moving on to the cornerbacks, and they are tied for 18th. They have Christian Gonzalez, the rookie from last year, coming back. To me, he still has to be great as their top guy. When he was playing, he actually played quite well, especially for a rookie corner. You hope they can come back from the injury and get back to form and continue his growth. Then you got uh, Jonathan Jones and Marcus Jones there, who really round out this cornerback group quite well. You know, tied for 18th, they, they, there is room for growth. I think that they will grow throughout the year. And I think just the way the defense of scheme in general gets deployed every week, it'll help them really, I think, outperform the tie, this tied for 18th grade more weeks than not. They got some interesting depth pieces here that they like to use. Alex Austin, they, they got Marcellus Dial, a rookie. Sean Wade, who's just a pure... Uh, slot guy who actually they really liked he was somebody who got a lot of hype at Ohio State as being a potential first round pick and then just got cooked week after week when they tried to play on the outside and so like a pure slot guy was just never going to be drafted highly and unfortunately he's never really developed the outside abilities yet here in the NFL either so his role is really there as a nickel and unfortunately the way that they play defense here in New England Guys like Jonathan Jones and Marcus Jones, they'll all be playing that nickel role. Jabril Peppers will be playing that role as well. You'll see a lot of different guys playing that spot. That, And because he struggles so much playing on the outside, his snap counts just won't be as welcoming without some type of injury to one of these to somebody like a Jonathan Jones or one of these top guys here where Jonathan Jones would then have to play solely on the outside. Um, and that's when Sean Wade would really get his opportunities. I think he'll get opportunities over Marcellus Dial. Um, I think he's more competing with Alex Austin, who I think is quietly going to be somebody who might be able to get some snap count snaps if he can make the team. If they see that uh, he is one to make the team. But where this is really going to shine is here with the safety group. They're tied for eighth in safety coverage. With Jabril Peppers getting an 86 and Kyle Duggar getting a 70. A really good combination here. Uh, Jabril Peppers, a really versatile, well-rounded safety. You can play everywhere. You never really know what he's doing because he can do everything. Kyle Duggar, you know, a little bit lesser than that. I would say you're really expecting him to play linebacker. Uh, or he's going to play like a more traditional strong safety. Eighth man in the box safety type. Uh, Brandon Schooler, I like him as a little backup here in these passing situations. If they want to go to that three safety set, he can low key be somebody they push in, especially if they want to play Kyle Duggar closer to the line. They want to play like that five one uh, formation, and Duggar is sort of your dime linebacker. I could see uh, Schooler getting on the field in that situation. That's when I would put him on uh, personally. But this is what really helps elevate this group. You know, tied for eighth in the league. And this is even what they're really the best at. But I think overall, the pass defense, back here in pass coverage, they're going to be able to put together some things here that, again, it's a, it's a t they play team defense as well as anybody. So how they well round everything uh, is going to be what is more the determining factor than the, I believe the skill sets of each individual player. Now moving on to the run defense, and we'll start with the edge players here. They're tied for eighth. You know, this is where Anthony Jennings really gets to come in and shine. First and second down, you line him up there at the outside linebacker spot. He's going to be dominant in the run game. This is where he lives. You know, I think Matthew Judon is your should be a three, a three down all purpose uh, edge player for you. Keon White again. I think he's sort of in the same vein as well he does he's you know he's like your number your true number three defensive end slash outside linebacker uh player for me edge player on this team really good i expect him his snap count to even go up even further i think they'll find different ways to use him uh throughout the season situationally you know a really good really really good room here and then you move to the interior, and they're seventh in the league with Christian Barmore and Armand Watts again. Again, a really great group. Daniel Ukulele, this is where you'll see him. Okuale and Anthony Jennings are your first early down defensive linemen slash 
you know, Jennings is case outside linebacker. But there's going to be a time where Barmore, Watts, Ukule are all going to be on the field together at the same time. You're going to see Judon and then Jennings out there as well with those five-man fronts with then like a Jelani Tavai in the back there just and it's going to be a really really frustrating team to try to run the ball against. They're going to be encouraging you to throw the football just with this group in general to be very hard to get past these guys to that second level. And then even when you get to the second level, you're running into the ninth best linebacker group against the run, starting with Jelani Tavai, who is a top level run defender as a linebacker. Then you got Sione Takitaki and Juwan Bentley, who this is where you're going to see, I think, Bentley get on the field uh, much more, uh, is on these early downs, part of this early down linebacker group. This is where Takitaki will probably find his way off the field because of the the mixing and matching they like to do. This will be the opportunities for Taki Taki to get off the field more than anything else. Uh, and then, you know, they'll put him out there maybe more passing situations for a linebacker. But Jelani, Jelani Devai is your all-purpose. He's your green dot linebacker for this exact reason, is that you're going to want him on the field for all things. He's your best linebacker, one of the best in the league coming off of last year. Just a tremendous, tremendous player. They don't have... The, the depth is an issue at linebacker, but the way that they're able to use the other players on the defense, it sort of lessens the blow, uh, obviously, unless you're losing Jelani Tavai. So th it's a good structure they built in the defense that's given them a bit of a safety blanket, uh, despite the, the lack of true talent in the that's going to be there as part of the depth pieces. But still, so you got the ninth linebacker group to go with the seventh and eighth defensive line bear. Like, just a great front seven that you're putting out there. And just when you thought it couldn't get better, they have the best defensive back run support unit in the entire NFL. I'm amazing. Jabril Peppers is probably the best safety one of, if he's not the best, he's in the top three safeties in run defense Kyle Duggar this is what he does really well they're just a great pairing it's they're so good you know Jalen Hawkins you'll see him get on the field in these situations this is what he's really built for that backup role on these early down situations to sort of compliment Brandon Schooler who I believe you'll see in passing situations Again, just an amazing, amazing group. This is the first unit that we've covered so far that is the best in the NFL by my grades. So, like, it's, again, if you run the ball really well like we saw at the offense, and now here you are stopping the run, you're going to be able to get the ball back in your offense's hands if you're losing in games because teams are going to try to run and they're not going to be able to against this defense. This is This is what makes this team the 25th ranked team and not the 30th ranked team is really this run defense right here the this group on the defense even their cornerbacks get a b grade for me in run defense so it, it's just one upgrade after another for them stopping the run the the concern is of course the depth and then there's like the rotation i believe on passing downs with that front four, you know, you want guy, you want Judon to sort of get back to the form that he was at. You want Keon White to take the next step forward. You know, he was a second round pick last year. You want him to take the step forward to be somebody that you feel is a full time starter. Uh, you know, three down defensive end slash outside linebacker. You want him to get to that point this year. I can't imagine this defense getting better, but this again, the coaching staff maintaining the continuity with these position groups, you know, again, it's kind of the depth of the linebackers and pass coverage. And then, you know, the front four rotation, that's really my only concern with this defense. So they are the third overall defense in the league for me coming in 76.94. They get a 75.9 grade 17th best pass defense and a 78.5, the number one run defense in the NFL. This is what this group is. This is what makes this team what it is. The defensive staff being kept basically almost completely for the most part. A lot of continuity there and a lot of continuity with the players as well. This is 
an amazingly good, talented group of players on the defense. So looking at the team as an overall, they are the 25th ranked team, 75.84 uh, ranking. Coaching staff gets a 77.75, good for 25th in the league. 28th ranked offense, tied for 28, 73.8. 7-4, and then the third best defense in the league, which really is what, again, brings this team up uh, to this 25th grade. And like I said, maybe outside their division, inside their division, I don't know if they do a whole lot, just the way those teams are built, but they're going to be a headache to play. If they play disciplined football, and they play strong, and they continue to play strong defense, and they just play, play mistake-free as possible on offense... They are going to be that that bottom that bottom ten team in the league that no good team wants to play. They're going to be the spoiler team at the end of the year that someone looks past, and then they get they get beaten. It kind of rattles a team's playoff uh, path path to the playoffs. That's going to be what this team does, and they're going to do that. I think better than any of the teams that we've really covered up to this point. And there you have it, my number 25 team in my 2024 NFL Deep Dive Series, the New England Patriots. Thanks for coming. Make sure to leave a thumbs up on this video. Even if you hated it, leave your hate comments in the comment section below and subscribe so you don't miss any of the future videos. And there's the rest of the series right there and right there. Enjoy, and I'll see you guys with the next video next time.